Welcome to the MOOC Tailored Materials and Enzymes for Industrial Processes. This is the third unit of the basic module and deals with recombinant enzyme production. In the last video, I explained the difference between enzyme production in the wild type organism, which is the natural producer, and in a genetically modified organism, in which our gene of interest, here in blue, is inserted either in a circular DNA molecule, a plasmid, or inserted into the genome. And because uh, cutting, well, we need to cut and close DNA in order to insert the gene, um, cutting and closing of DNA is uh, referred to as recombination, and therefore such a host would be a recombinant host. And we talk here about re recombinant enzyme production means enzyme production in a, in a genetically modified cell. This has several advantages, and the most striking is that we can choose um, the regulatory elements of our choice uh, and also induce them when we want to induce them. And we also usually have a lot of experience with these induction systems. So we can just use this in routine procedures and do not need to invent the wheel again for each new enzyme we want to produce. Another advantage is also um, that we can insert the uh, gene into a carrier where we know the copy number. So low and medium copy number plasmids have a tightly regulated copy number, and then we can use a plasmid with, for instance, a copy number of 15, or we put the gene into the genome, and then we have the same copy number as all the other genes. So, in short, genetically modification and recombinant expression and give us much more control over the process than the production in a wild-type cell. So, I would like to talk about heterologous gene expression, and then I explain a um, system for the induction of enzyme production, which is quite important. So this means we can switch on gene expression in a cell. And finally, I want to wrap it up with a few points to consider. This figure shows a simplified bacterial cell with flagellar and a plasma membrane, a cell wall. So a gram-negative cell would have an additional plasma membrane on the outside. And here we see ribosomes. And here we see two different carriers of genetic modification. So we have a genome, which is a large circular chromosome, and then we have plasmids, and you see we have several copies of a plasmid. A plasmid is a short circular DNA molecule, and we see here in both cases the DNA is supercoiled and tightly packed. Both the DNA carrier, genome and plasmids, have different functions. Genomic DNA is the carrier of more of essential genes. This includes all housekeeping genes, the genes for polymerases, tRNAs, the, the genes encoding ribosomal RNA and ribosomal proteins, and the cell and biosynthesis, the basic catabolism, the anabolism of uh, the, 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 the required metabolites. All of this is encoded, encoded in the genome, and this means the in genome is necessary for, uh, for, the regular, um, for the regular survival of a bacterium. The genome also contains some genes that are only needed under stress but this is usually frequently encountered stress. For instance, um, for instance, um, genes for heat shock are encoded in the genome. Heat shock is something quite frequent, so um, a bacterium from the intestines that needs to change the host obviously encounters different temperatures. And for instance, uh, while the bacterium thrives at 37 degrees, if the host when, when the host has a fever, there will be 40 degrees centigrade. This puts an enormous stress on the cell and then genes are um, activated that um, produce factors that protect the cell. For instance, the aided uh, folding of proteins by chaperones. Plasmids, however, um, encode genes that are not needed for regular survival. One of the first, one of the earliest encountered examples in a plasmid was, was a gene encoding for a tolerance against mercury. So this mechanism was an enzyme that reduced mercury cations to the metal and then the metal could easier diffuse out of the cell. And this would um, prevent or this um, would alleviate the cell from the inhibitory effect of the heavy metal. It is obvious that usually bacteria do not encounter um, mercury in the habitat, but once um, mercury is present, the cells bearing the plasmids have an enormous advantage over all the other cells. And this can be important to ensure the survival of the population. However, 
each plasmid also represents a metabolic burden. And this means that the plasmid um, slows down the growth of the host. So bacteria have to be careful with the DNA they're carrying. And one solution is that only a small part of a population carries such an important gene and then gives an enormous, uh, has an enormous growth advantage under a selection pressure. And this, this can really contribute to the survival of the species. Another trait which is quite often on plasmids are antibiotic resistances. This is something we encounter in our hospitals. And a third trait are special catabolic capacities, for instance, the capacity to, to, to degrade hydrocarbons. Plasmids are also mobile. This means they can quite easily share with other cells. And this is very practical for biotechnology because it is also quite easy to insert a plasmid into a cell. Let's have a look at the typical composition of a plasmid. A plasmid is a circular DNA molecule of a few thousand base pairs of length, and all plasmids have an origin of replication. This is needed um, to initiate the amplification of the plasmid during cell division, and without such an origin, the, pl uh, the plasmid will simply not be amplified and get lost during the cell division. The origin of replication is a signal sequence, and sometimes it also is a site of the of genes of regulatory proteins, and these proteins would bind to the signal sequence and then uh, recruit the DNA polymerase and lead to the initiation complex of replication. This is strictly needed for the replication, thus the amplification of, of, um, uh, of the plasmid. So without such a site um, and without independent replication, a plasmid cannot exist in a cell. To stabilize the plasmid in the cell, there's usually a marker gene. This marker gene usually has a constitutive promoter which always um, expresses, expresses the gene. So um, this uh, the plasmid is uh, constitutes a metabolic load. So cells without the plasmid would grow faster well, if the plasmid would get lost. And there's a daughter cell that uh, does not have the plasmid anymore. It would outgrow the others. And therefore, we introduce a marker gene. This marker gene uh, gives the cell a growth advantage under certain conditions in order to ensure that those cells that grow have the plasmid. Then there is the expression cassette, which is the transcription promoter, the gene of interest, and the transcription terminator. And here, the transcription promoter, of course, is needed to initiate uh, the activity of the RNA polymerase. And a terminator is also always needed because without active termination, trans uh, transcription is very inefficient. So transcription leads to the mRNA, and then the mRNA leads to our enzyme of interest. It is obvious that the concentration of our enzyme of interest correlates with the mRNA concentration. And there's two ways how we can achieve a high mRNA concentration. The first one is to use a strong promoter. So this means a very active transcription here at this place. Or we use a multi-copy plasmid. So uh, simply said, if, it, if, if we have a copy of a plasmid of five copies or another one of 50 copies, we would get 10 times more mRNA provided we use the same promoter. And um, uh, there's a big difference. If we use a high copy plasmid, this also means that the metabolic load of the plasmid makes the growth of the cell slower and also, um, also redirects resources that should be used for, for the production of our enzyme. And therefore, what is done nowadays is that a low copy plasmid or medium copy plasmid is used, so typically with 15 copies per cell, and a very, very strong promoter, and this gives a lot of mRNA, and this, this up to 20% of total protein um, uh, of the enzyme of interest. Low, um, high copy plasmids are usually then used if um, we want to produce, to use E. coli to produce a lot of DNA for some purposes. There are different types of plasmids. So there are low copy number plasmids, medium copy number plasmids, and high copy number plasmids. And this is defined here with the origin of replication. And there are uh, two classes of marker genes. One class uses resistance against antibiotics. So the protein produced would be an enzyme that degrades, uh, degrades an antibiotic or provides an alternative target. A typical example for um, the degradation or the inactivation of an antibiotic is the beta-lactamase, which attacks the beta-lactam ring of penicillin antibiotics. And when we add this antibiotics to the um, culture, only cells with a beta-lactamase survive can, or can grow. And this means only cells that have the plasmid with the marker gene. 
This has a drawback because we need to add the antibiotic and there are some applications where, an anti uh, where the addition of antibiotics is problematic. For instance, if you want to use a protein for foot application and there metabolic complementation is used. In metabolic complementation, the cell is missing the gene of a biosynthesis of an important metabolite, for instance, methionine. And when the cell is grown on a minimal medium, which does not contain methionine, then the uh, cell cannot grow or grows very, very slowly. Um, the marker gene then is precisely the gene which was inactivated in the genome, and the plasmid complements this biosynthetic pathway, meaning that um, cells having the plasmid can grow. And um, uh, this is uh, this does not require to add antibiotics. It has an, another drawback. The um, strain missing the biosynthetic gene is called auxotroph. And um, this limits our flexibility to work with different strains. So in research, I want to work, or, or I, I might want to work with many different strains that can help offer me different features and can help me to um, produce my enzyme or produce it better. For instance, the feature to um, form better disulfy bonds of proteins. And with an antibiotic resistance, I can put the plasma into any strain and put uh, express the gene of the antibiotic resistance there. Uh, if I use metabolic complementation, I have, much, I have much less flexibility because I always need an, an oxytrophic strain, and there are not so many of this, and it is quite difficult to develop um, such a strain with a genome modification. So as a rule of thumb, for research purposes, there's a lot of flexibility. Flexibility is very important, and therefore antibiotics are, are used. And for production, the production strain is well known, and there it's better to avoid the use of an antibiotic and use metabolic complementation. Plasmids have different features, but um, these are the features that are essential for enzyme production. The, um, the gene cassette consists of a regulatory um, region for the initiation of transcription, which is usually the, uh, the site of the promoter. And we have a site for its termination, and in between are one or several genes. So bacteria can have very well several genes under the control of the same promoter, and they would be produced at the same time. The resulting mRNA has then the so-called operating frames, the start codons and the stop codons of the different enzymes, and in between ribosome binding sites. These are sequences that are complementary to an RNA in the small subunit of the ribosome, and the, and the small this and uh, the ribosome binds to this, and this starts the initiation of. Um, of, of, of translation. So this is a called ribosome binding site or after the two researchers who discovered it, the Schein-Dalgano sequence. And here this, in this example, the mRNA has three Schein-Dalgano sequences, which means three different proteins can be produced. And um, the production of the enzyme can be regulated at a transcriptional level and a translational level. In this, this example, the concentration of the mRNA depends on the strength of the promoter. But the mRNA, of course, for, for gene A, B, and C will be the same. However, um, different ribosome binding sites can be used that can be um, differently um, recognized by the ribosome. And with this, different concentrations of protein A and B can be achieved. For this lecture, I want to focus on the promoter, how the promoter can be switched on and switched off. So for this, I want to go back for a very old phenomenon what is called dioxin growth. This is simply when bacteria are cultivated on a mixture of different sugars, often there's a biphasic growth. So here in this example, there's glucose, and there's a disaccharide type lactose. Lactose consists of um, glucose and galactose, and there's a beta galactosidase needed in order to hydrolyze it. And without this beta galactosidase, E. coli cannot use it as a growth source. So when people use these mixtures, they found that there's a biphasic growth curve. Growth curve. The cells grow, and after a while, they stop to make a pause, and then they uh, then growth is continued. And it was found that first the glucose is uh, consumed, and only when the uh, when all glucose is consumed, then uh, the growth on lactose starts. This we can see here: the beta lactose galactosidase, which is needed for the degradation of lactose, is only produced when glucose is depleted. So um, there's a reason for that. The reason is that E. coli can get more energy from glucose because less enzymes are needed for the degradation. Precisely here, there's a permease which lets lactose into the cell, 
and there's also the beta galactosidase itself and this is additional energy so nature evolved bacteria that they always focus on the most efficient um, carbon source and this is called um, c catabolite repression and this phenomenon can be used for targeted induction of our enzyme production so the mechanism works on a molecular level works with an enzyme cascade and an active transporter glucose is transported into the cell and in the transport it's phosphorylated this transport is active so it works against a constant uh, 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 it works also at very low glucose concentration there's no uh, concentration gradient necessary the chemical energy from this comes from the hydrolysis of phosphorylated pyruvate and um, the pyruvate and then the phosphate group is transferred via different enzymes to the glucose in order to achieve here this biphatic growth, the cell needs to be able to determine is there glucose or not, and is there lactose or not. And here we have the mechanism how the cell can identify if there's glucose or not. Glucose is transported with an active transport into the cell, and at the same time it's phosphorylated. This is active transport, this means it also works against a um, concentration gradient, and this is very important in case there's not so much glucose in the medium. The chemical energy for the active transport comes from phosphorylated pyruvate, which is then here it gives pyruvate and an enzyme cascade that transports the phosphor um, groups to, um, to an enzyme called enzyme 2A, and this then transfers the phosphate group to the uh, transporter and then to the glucose. So um, the free enzyme 2A inhibits the permeases of other metabolites, so it means it suppresses the uptake. And this means in such a situation, lactose cannot induce any more of the synthesis of its own genes. So this we call inducer exclusion. There's also the phosphorylated enzyme 2A activates an enzyme called adenate, adenylate cyclase. So ATP is, ATP is converted to C AMP, cyclic AMP. So in the first situation, when we have glucose in the medium, there is a quick, almost a quick transfer of the phosphate to the glucose, resulting in a large amount of free enzyme 2A, and this then represses the uptake of other metabolites like lactose. Um, if there is little, uh, if there's a low glucose concentration in the medium, then the phosphorylated A2A will accumulate because there is no glucose to accept the phosphate group, and this then activates the adenylate the cyclase. Um, leading to the synthesis of CAMP, and CAMP is a global signal in the cell of low glucose levels. So the ratio of enzyme 2A and enzyme 2B, uh, and, and, and then phosphorylated enzyme 2A and free enzyme 2A, in, uh, this is our biosensor, how much glucose is in the medium, and this works because this transporter is highly specific for glucose. Here we have now an uh, uh, operon of the genes of um, lactose degradation and i suggest we we focus now on the beta galactosidase which is needed to hydrolyze the disaccharide and release the uh, glucose and galactose so there are two more genes one is a permease the other is not important right now in one mrna here's a regulatory region and there's a second gene with a constitutive promoter which is called LACR. so when there's low glucose there's camp and then the camp um and then the, then the camp uh, activates a, a, pro a, a protein they call it the um, CMP regulated protein and this then binds to the DNA and activates transcription so this is an activator and without this activation there will be very little transcription of the gene so this means once the glucose is depleted the CMP activates alternative genes but this alone is not sufficient the LACR gene um, uh, encodes for tetrameric um, um, repressor. This is always there. This repressor is always associated to the DNA, and in the free form, it binds to the promoter and prevents um, prevents the production of the mRNA. So, um, in short, if there is no glucose and no lactose, then there would be very little production of the mRNA. Um, once lactose enters the cell, the beta galactosidase hydrolyzes it into glucose and galactose, but there's also a side reaction when allolactose is formed, and allolactose then um, binds to the repressor, and now the repressor has a much lower binding constant, constant for the promoter and does not bind. So this means uh, only within the presence of lactose 
uh, there will be production of this mRNA. And um, if we have glucose and lactose at the same time, then a bit lactose still might enter the cell, but then we miss the activation by CMP and there will also be little mRNA production. So efficient mRNA production only takes place once the uh, lactose repressor is derepressed and when low glucose um, leads to formation of CAMP and the CAMP mediated activation. So uh, um, this is how uh, lactose um, degradation is encoded. And we use this system in biotechnology in order to um, produce a gene, of, uh, a, a gene product of interest. So by simply substituting these op the lactose operon of these three genes with our gene of interest, then we can use the same regulation, but now the mRNA encodes our enzyme of interest, and we can activate our gene production by the addition of lactose. This is the basic principle, and um, the time of induction is quite important. At the end of the day, we want to produce a lot of protein, but for this we also need a lot of biomass. So um, here we see a typical growth curve of a bacterium. Here's inoculation. The cells need a bit of time to adapt for the medium. The genes that are, the genes are expressed, for instance, for the utilization of the carbon source, etc. And once the cells have adapted, they enter the exponential phase where the cells double every half hour, every 20 minutes. And in this phase, everything is focused on growth, which is everything is focused on the synthesis of amino acids and, um, and, and nucleotides which are then used to produce proteins and nucleic acids, like tRNAs or like ribosomes. And um, we want to use all these ribosomes for the production of our target enzyme. And this is why we induce enzyme production usually in the exponential phase. However, the um, production of a protein also slows down cell growth. So we're talking here about up to 20% of the cell's proteins is our target enzyme. So if you would start here, then the cell would grow slower and everything would take longer. So to optimize this, we let the cell grow a bit and then suddenly induce right in the exponential phase. So we ensure we have metabolically very active cells, but they also um, we also have sufficient biomass. Here, then so, uh, sooner or later, we will have an, a limiting factor. Growth will stop. And here, uh, there will be much less enzyme production. So this means it doesn't make much sense. Uh, usually to induce the stationary phase. So the system I just uh, presented you can also be used for a highly efficient production system using the T7 polymerase. T7 is a bacterial phage, and this has a very strong polymerase with a very, very strong promoter. So this promoter allows us with a low copy plasmid or medium copy plasmid to um, produce an enormous amount of mRNA, which leads, what I said, up to, up to 15 or 20% of the total protein of the cell. So and in this case, the uh, gene of interest is on a plasmid under the control of the T7 promoter, which means without the T7 polymerase, there's absolutely no um, term transcription. The E. coli RNA polymerases cannot recognize this gene point. Once the T7 polymerase is produced, then this polymerase will only activate, activate this, this single gene will not activate any E. coli genes because it is specific for the T7 promoter, and this means we only induce production of this gene. So now the trick is that this polymerase was put under the control of the lac promoter, and this is regulated as I told you before. So for instance, we can cultivate our cells with glycerol, and then at a certain point, we add IPTG. IPTG is a lactose derivative. It has a similar um, effect like lactose on the uh, lac I on the lac repressor, but it is not degraded by the cell. Cells catabolize lactose, so we would always have different um, inducer concentrations. This is something we don't want. And IPTG is not uh, catabolized, not degraded, so uh, the concentration will stay the same like we induced in the initial phase. So IPTG uh, is is uh, is is up um, is and then it will derepress the lac promoter. This will then lead to the Synthesis of the T7 polymerase, it will recognize the T7 promoter and produce a lot of our target enzyme. This is a very simple system, so it is how at a certain point of time we can suddenly uh, induce a transcription of a gene of interest. This system was also used for a much more sophisticated system, which is called auto induction medium. 
the, and this system you uses the biphasic growth I was explaining you at the beginning of this lecture. So to repeat, we have a biphasic system. The first phase we have glucose, and the glucose prevents the activation of the lactose genes, which also means that the T7 polymerase now is inactive because it's under the lact promoter. And once glucose is con consumed, then uh, lac the lactose catabolization kicks in. Here we have then this production of the beta galactosidase showing that the lact promoter is active now, and this also then activates production of T7 polymerase. So in the beginning, we have glucose in the medium, which leads to low CIMP, and this means no activation here. Also, the lactose permease is inhibited, meaning lactose cannot, cannot enter the cell, and this means also the lac repressor sits on this and prevents and prevents um, transcription. So after a few hours, then glucose is consumed. Now there is CIMP, and the CIMP uh, binds to the CR protein, which then activates transcription, and also the lac repressor is derepressed, meaning we get T7 polymerase, and this then produces our gene of interest. This system works without the addition of an inducer, which is quite handy. So it is not such a big difference if we work in the fermenter, but if we produce our enzyme in microliter plates, for instance, in directed enzyme evolution, then it is quite a task to add inducer to 50,000 cells in these small plates, and each manipulation step is an error source. So in these cases, we can just put in our plates uh, at 6 p.m. in the evening into incubator. After a few hours, glucose is consumed. The cells have grown. So there's some cell density, but now then uh, glucose is consumed and lactose um, induces the enzyme production. So this is a non-invasive way to produce an enzyme. So to conclude, just a few points to consider. So we want to produce a lot of protein in a soluble form per cultivation volume and also per gram biomass. And for this, it is very important to discuss or to consider, do we want to integrate our gene into the genome or do we want to express it from a plasmid? Then the copy number of a plasmid is very important. And usually low to medium copy plasmids are used because there's less metabolic load for the cell. And the copy number is tightly controlled. We also have to think about the marker gene. And for research, antibiotics are often used, antibiotic resistances, because this can be used with many strains without mo modification. Auxotrophy, which means the a knockout of a gene of a biosynthesis, this is more used for production purposes because then it's only one single strain. Flexibility is not so much needed, but this avoids the use of antibiotics. Then in the induction, I presented you the example of a promoter. And the big question is always a strong or weak promoter. The strong promoter gives us a lot of protein. Sometimes we overload the folding machinery, particularly with difficult proteins, for instance, proteins that contain disulfide bonds, then a weak promoter might be preferred. We have to consider our special strains needed. For the system I just showed you, for the T7 system, we need strains that have the T7 polymerase in the genome. This is a widely used system, so there are many strains available. The, the feature is called T7. But there are still a lot, of, a lot of strains that don't have this, and in these cases, we need to use a different system. Another question is, if we have a tight or leaky promoter, I just told you that the lack promoter is a bit leaky, so there will be always some residual production, and for difficult-to-produce enzymes, a tight uh, promoter might be better. And finally, we should um, consider how the control of transcription activity works. It's always good to know what we are doing, and uh, I discussed this a while ago with a student in an exam, and uh, there was a case that in the master thesis, it was difficult to produce an enzyme to get a, enough amount of this. And then she suggested as a strategy to improve enzyme yield to add glucose to get more biomass and then also get more protein. So why this is true is that at this moment, um, it is important to keep in mind, if we add glucose to get more biomass yield, in this particular system, we would activate C-catabolite and, and repression and inactivate the um, promoter that encodes for the T7 polymerase. So in this case, it is counterproductive to add glucose in order to get more biomass. So this is why it's quite important to know the molecular mechanisms of the way how an enzyme is produced. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and see you hopefully in the next video. Thank you.